Hello, I'm Mariam Ram of TNQ. Welcome to the second of the TNQ Janelia India COVID-19 seminars. Today we have three speakers, Professor Joseph Derisi of the University of California, San Francisco, who will speak on the CLEAR Hub, student volunteer run COVID testing, followed by Professor Zulas Kulthur and Sandeep Juneja of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, presenting the Mumbai Series Survey facts and interpretations. The COVID-19 pandemic has inflicted unimaginable chaos, misery, and economic disruption. It has widened inequalities in health, income, and wealth. Nowhere are these effects more stark than in India where the pandemic is still raging. We have to look to science as much as to sound and just public policy to help us find a way out of this crisis. We are fortunate today to have scientists working on the front line sharing their latest research at these seminars. Today our speakers will discuss the epidemiology of the disease COVID-19 and present their recent findings on community transmission of SARS-CoV-2. In presenting these seminars, TNQ is privileged to partner with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Janelia Research Campus in Ashburn, Virginia, which has provided the scientific and technical expertise and to have the support of the National Center of the Biological Sciences in Bangalore. May I now hand over to Ron Vale, Executive Director of Janelia Research Campus. Well, thank you, Mariam, and uh, thank you for initiating this effort to explain the science of COVID-19 to India and the rest of the world. Um, I just want to say that this is very important work that you're doing and Janelia Research Campus is very proud to partner with you in this lecture series. And today I'm very much looking forward to this interesting pair of talks on the molecular biology and epidemiology of COVID-19 in San Francisco and in Mumbai. And now I'd like to uh, extend thanks to Janelia's co-organizers of this series. Uh, Sarada Viswanathan and Janine Stevens, and you'll be hearing from them very shortly. I would now like to pass the program on to um, the director of the National Center for Biological Sciences, G2 Mayer. Uh, thanks, uh, Ron, uh, for that. And uh, thank you, Mariam, for uh, organizing this series. I mean, it's really a pleasure and the privilege uh, to uh, be helping out uh, with, uh, with this uh, TNQ uh, Janelia COVID uh, set of lectures. Um, from, from our side, uh, uh, at the time when the COVID-19 crisis rages and India appears to be headed towards being perhaps one of the epicenters of infection, there has been a tremendous convergence of scientists the world over to provide possible avenues to address this crisis. I mean, this has been literally unprecedented. Uh, there has been unprecedented collaboration among scientists, both near and far, to bring uh, and understand the biology of the virus, study its mechanisms of spread, and also its amelioration. Uh, true to the tradition of bringing the latest and cutting edge science to Indian audiences, uh, TNQ, this time in partnership, as we heard with Janelia, uh, brings to us some of the latest in these areas. And of course, we are delighted to support this effort. For this talk on the spread of the disease, uh, we have invited uh, Joe DeVisi, a pioneer in infectious disease diagnosis and, and also its uh, molecular biology, uh, also one of the originators of the corona, uh, one of the discoverers of this SARS COVID virus in 2003, uh, followed by a second seminar by my colleagues from the uh, TIFR uh, Kolaba campus uh, on the Mumbai Zero Survey uh, and its follow-up. Uh, after the lecture, we'll have a panel discussion, following which there will be a set of questions uh, from our audience. Uh, but let me first introduce the panel for today. Uh, we have Dr. Jacob John uh, and Professor Shashidara, uh, and the discussion is moderated by Rashna Bandari. Uh, Rashna is a biochemist 
who studies the cellular and physiological function of inositol pyrophosphates and inorganic phosphates. And naturally, she took it upon herself to set up and run a diagnostic lab to detect another polyphosphorylated sugar, the COVID-19 RNA, um, uh, this time by the RT-PCR reaction. She has done this along with her colleagues at the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics in Hyderabad, uh, and where she is, in fact, group leader and head of the Laboratory of Cell Signaling. Uh, our panelists are Dr. Shashidara, Dean of Research at Ashoka University. Uh, he used to be Dean uh, at the Indian Institute of Scientific Research and Education, ISER in Pune, uh, where he uh, is currently uh, speaking from, I believe. Uh, besides uh, being a geneticist and a developmental biologist, Shashi is a very keen, uh, uh, very keenly engaged with research-based pedagogical training of undergraduate teachers, uh, especially in climate change education. He is involved in many, many COVID-19 related projects in India, including many of them with the National Center for Biological Science. Uh, but in particular, for this uh, lecture, he's uh, been uh, intimately connected to the CERO survey that's happening in Pune. Um, Dr. Jacob John, our other panelist, is Professor of Community Medicine at the Christian Medical College, CMC, Belo, uh, where he teaches infectious disease epidemiology. Uh, Dr. Jacob John uh, has been a key part of the COVID-19 response in India. He supports uh, research groups examining the epidemiology of the pandemic in multiple settings using a combination of mathematical modeling, clinical and zero epidemiological studies, and has also worked with Sashi on the zero survey in Pune. Uh, Professor John's uh, uh, research and public health focus are on the prevention and control of pediatric infectious diseases. Today, he leads a research network that estimates the burden of enteric fever in India and is also involved in setting up cohorts for the long-term monitoring of uh, several infectious diseases, including uh, COVID-19. Uh, and now let me invite uh, Sharda, uh, who is in fact indeed a molecular biologist herself and is now engaged in science outreach and uh, actively engaged in training and education efforts at the Genelia campus. Um, and let me invite her to, in, to introduce the speakers. Uh, uh, good evening and good morning uh, to listeners across the world. Thank you, Professor Mayer. Hello, everyone. We welcome you all back to the second session in the TNQ Genelia India COVID-19 seminars. Uh, let me quickly walk you all through the session once again. We will have two talks today. Our first speaker is Professor Joe DeRisi from UCSF. The second talk will be delivered jointly by Professor Ullas Kolthur and Professor Sandeep Chuneja, both from TIFR. Like last week, the talks will be followed by a panel discussion where the speakers will be joined by the panelists for the day, Dr. Jacob John, Dr. Shashi Dara, and the session will be moderated by Dr. Rashna Bhandari. We will then be ready to take on questions from the audience. Regarding questions, Please feel free to post your questions at any time during the talk or the discussion in your respective Q&A boxes, Zoom or YouTube. But we do request you that you please indicate who your question is directed to, the speaker or the panelist, or which speaker, which panelist. Uh, that's really useful for us to address the question. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers for the day, Professor Derizi, Professor Kolthur, and Professor Juneja. Professor Derizi, he is the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at UCSF. He received his undergraduate degrees in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a PhD in biochemistry from Stanford University uh, before joining UCSF faculty as a Sadler Fellow in 1999. A brief intro to his work, Using an interdisciplinary approach combining genomics, bioinformatics, biochemistry, and bioengineering, Professor DeRisi studies a range of viral and parasitic infections, including Plasmodium falciparum, which we all know causes malaria. And early work in his lab 
has contributed to some fundamental understanding of the SARS classic way back in 2003. More recently, through his role as the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, he has redirected his efforts to providing large-scale rapid turnaround clinical COVID-19 testing through a UCSF Biohub collaboration called the ClearHub. Stay tuned, we'll hear more about ClearHub shortly. Our second speaker is Professor Ullas Koltur from the Department of Biological Sciences at the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research, Mumbai. He received his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India. And after completing his postdoctoral studies at IGBMC Strasbourg, he joined TIFR as a research faculty in 2008. Professor Koltur has a range of research interests. His main interest lies in trying to unravel the genetic, molecular, and biochemical components that connect dietary inputs to cellular functions. He studies this using cutting edge techniques on a range of model systems from fruit flies, rodents, uh, human derived cells. And more recently, in the wake of the current pandemic, Professor Koltur has also redirected his focus on the epidemiology of the SARS-CoV-2 as he, um, and he'd probably talk to us about that today. Um, Professor Sandeep Juneja, our third speaker, is the Dean at the School of Technology and Computer Science at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He received his BTEC in Mechanical Engineering from IIT Delhi and his Master's in Statistics and PhD in Operations Research, both from Stanford University. And he's been a faculty at TIFR since 2003. His research interests lie in applied probability, including sequential learning, mathematical finance, Monte Carlo methods, and game theoretic analysis of cues. And lately, he's been exploring some aspects of modeling epidemic spread, about which I guess we'll hear shortly. So once again, a very warm welcome to our speakers. We profusely thank you for your time and look forward to hearing from you. With that, Professor Derizi. Great, uh, thank you for having me here. I'm gonna to switch to sharing my screen. Okay, we should be full screen now. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers uh, for uh, inviting me to this presentation. It's very early here in the morning in San Francisco, so I hope I'm lively enough and awake enough uh, to be on point. Uh, my name is Joe DeRisi. Uh, I'm a professor of biochemistry at UCSF, as mentioned, and I'm the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biob together with my colleague, Steve Quake, at Stanford. And to give you a little bit of context in this, in this talk, uh, the, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, which probably very few have ever heard of, is a nonprofit research organization associated with UCSF, Berkeley, and Stanford, where we're really trying to understand the fundamentals of uh, disease mechanisms with an eye towards actionable diagnostics and therapeutics. Now, as, as, as part of this effort, we have an infectious disease initiative. And that infectious disease initiative pre-COVID was built on four pillars, that of detection, response, treatment, and prevention. And our group leaders in the infectious disease initiative are shown below. They were engaged in a wide variety of projects uh, pre-COVID that are listed up above. You can guarantee pretty much every one of them is doing COVID-based projects now. But I'll mention one in particular because it provides context of how we got into this and where we are now and that's the Global IDC Portal Project. So the Global IDC Portal Project was a project to stand up genomic metagenomic sequencing in a variety of countries around the world by providing compute and storage and pipeline accessibility to process samples from either human patients, from livestock, from insects, to be able to detect new and emerging threats. In other words, IDSeq was an early warning radar for real-time pathogen monitoring and detection that was hopefully going to be deployed worldwide. And so we, in 2019, the BioHub together with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we're in the process of standing up multiple sites around the world as part of the Grand Challenges Explorations Program. And shown here in early January 27th, remember when the pandemic looked like this? Seems like so long ago, right? Uh, those yellow circles indicate 
different countries and places where we were standing up metagenomic sequencing um, capabilities for detection of novel disease. Uh, and that include places like Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Nepal, and so on. And uh, this was a, a very exciting project. And it turns out that in early January, uh, we were just finishing standing up the site in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh. And it was only a few weeks later in late January when this slide was taken that the very first case of coronavirus was reported in Cambodia, brought in by a Chinese tourist. And uh, we were very, very excited by this because at that time, first of all, there was no COVID yet that we knew of in the United States. Uh, and the IDC system was successful in detecting and actually uh, capturing the entire genome of that COVID-19 uh, isolate uh, together with our, our colleagues in Cambodia and the Pasteur Institute. And so the system seemed to function as it was intended. We are very happy with that. And I was thinking personally that this was going to be a little bit like SARS-1 back in 2003. And what I did not know and did not appreciate was a fundamental difference in how this virus is spread. And that is it infects and uh, a great number of people who are totally asymptomatic. And that is a major component of how or why this pandemic is so difficult to control. And so fast forward from January to February and COVID-19 where we were sitting in San Francisco was no longer a remote risk. It was in our backyard in California, all over the place. And, uh, and that really changed how we began to think about things. We immediately shifted gears. What could we do to be involved? Are we going to be doing surveillance of asymptomatics? Should we be in drug development? Should we try to get into vaccine development? What kind of basic science can we do? But you know, in stopping transmission chains and controlling the pandemic, we could think of nothing more important to do than to address clinical testing. Yes, we did many of these other things that are listed here, but clinical testing is something that is immediately actionable. Now, there are issues uh, in the United States with clinical testing. There are very strict regulations. So, you know, if you have a laboratory in, uh, in a research university, you might ask yourself if you're in the United States, you know, I know how to do RT-PCR. That's no big deal. Why can't I just, you know, fire up my PCR machine and start testing people? And the answer to that in, in California, the United States is, you know, absolutely no, you cannot do that. That is illegal. Clinical testing is governed by a large number of federal, uh, federal and state agencies uh, that regulate how uh, health is assessed in any human being from a biological sample. So this looked like a, a fairly insurmountable obstacle, but through a lot of diligent work that I don't have time to discuss here today and with some uh, regulation changes here in California, we were able then to contemplate actually doing clinical testing um, as it is described uh, by federal and state agencies. And so we immediately then organized ourselves at the Biohub to change how we did things. Uh, we then took all of our personnel that were normally working on all different kinds of projects and broke them all into teams. Teams that would address issues around our facilities, our supply chain, our automation teams, who takes out the waste, how do we do reagent prep, the data flow, all this stuff. So basically we took about a, you know, somewhere around 80 people that had other jobs doing other projects and said, you now have a new project. Time to stop what you're doing and do this and this alone, uh, which was really exciting, but also very, very stressful. And so uh, we designed a flow in which it's not very uh, sophisticated, it's fairly obvious, obviously, where patient samples are brought in through UCSF. We accession them, which means capturing their you know, uh, personal health information, names, you know, birth dates, all that. Uh, they are queued, RNA is extracted, qPCR is done, and then a report is generated and back it goes. We also do viral genome sequencing on the positives, and I'll have a lot to say about that. But this flow chart was just on paper. When we started this in early March, uh, we had nothing but an empty lab, and that's our lab manager, Jen, standing there on March 13th. There was nothing in this space. We uh, rallied these troops as well as over 150 graduate student postdoc volunteers, largely from UCSF. You have to remember the graduate students were not allowed to come into work. So most of them were sitting at home twiddling their thumbs. 
What better thing than to give them some purpose and come in and volunteer? We immediately scaled up and stockpiled huge quantities of supplies. Uh, and we made sure to avoid supply chains that were cited in either the WHO protocols or the CDC protocols, because we knew they would already be impacted by great numbers of buyers and thus be limited. So that was an early strategic decision that we made that turned out to be uh, extremely beneficial as we were essentially never impacted by the supply chain issue after we uh, um, decided to do that. Our, our, our whole teams organized, developed a little uh, protocols and all the command center materials. All the robots were calibrated and brought in. We had many, many labs donate equipment or at least loan us equipment. You know, we'll have to give it back someday. And uh, uh, we were able to then set up this lab in an extremely short amount of time. So it took about eight days from March uh, uh, 12th when we started to March 20th. On March 20th, we delivered our first clinical result. That is a patient result back to a patient that was so-called CLIA validated. CLIA is a set of laboratory amendments and laws that govern clinical testing here in the United States. Um, and so that was sort of a, a record for the time. And since then we've been testing like crazy to uh, tell you a little bit about that. We now test the student run, largely student run volunteer organization test for about 20 odd counties of the 58 counties in California shown here on green. Uh, to date, we've performed about 150,000 tests. So it's very small in sort of the context of the entire United States, but um, we focus that testing on very particular populations and on very particular cases. So uh, we felt we could fill a gap where others were not. You have to remember at this time, many of the, the large diagnostic companies in the United States like LabCorp and Quest and others were experiencing major, major delays. And uh, the state facilities were not running at full capacity or were impacted by supply chain. Local hospitals had supply chain issues. So this was our opportunity to step in and fill the gap where testing was falling short. So I'd like to now tell you about some of the results of that testing in the remaining time that I have here. And uh, there's a couple interesting studies I'd like to touch upon. One of them we refer to as the mission study. It has a number of other names. It was conducted with my close colleague, Dan Havlier and many other colleagues at UCSF and U UC Berkeley. And of course, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, most chiefly Emily Crawford, our team leader. So the, 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 question here was rather than just testing symptomatic patients that happen to show up at your testing facility, perhaps at a hospital or so on, you know, are we missing the story? Is there a, a distribution of the virus in our communities that we're not quite cognizant of? We need to go and assay the community itself uh, directly. And so that means a, a surveillance study within, for example, a geographic region or census tract. Now there was a lot of pushback from this. Um, was it even possible? There was a lot of community logistics that were you know, problematic and people said it couldn't be done. There was a perception that people wouldn't be willing to be tested. They were worried, uh, people were worried about whether they were giving their personal health information to the government or some other, somebody else. People were worried that our lab would run out of supplies if we tried to do this uh, or that we didn't have a system to get results back to patients. Um, these were all unfounded worries, as we, as we soon proved, but they were legitimate concerns. So the Mission District is a neighborhood in San Francisco, for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, and within the Mission District, we have a four by four block area that we chose that is uh, roughly about 4,000 adults in this very small area of the city. It's about 58% Latinx. Um, that's the sort of non-gender specific term for Latino, Hispanic, and so on. Uh, and um, it is a very dense area of housing here in the city. And so uh, the idea was then not to just wait for volunteers to show up and be tested, but literally go door to door and recruit them out of the houses. That's what was done. I don't have time to tell you about all the logistics there, but let's get to the results. In total, 4,160 people were tested in a two-day period or so, or they at least it collected over a two-day period. The gender distribution is shown at the left, um, fairly even with a slight bias towards males. The population itself was about 44% Latinx, 
Caucasian 38%, Asian 11%, and a, and a smattering of other um, ethnicities shown below. Now, we were very, very uh, surprised, although we shouldn't have been, I guess, by the results. Um, of the PCR positive individuals, which at this time was a small percentage of so 61 people, there was a real disparity in, uh, in, in some of the questionnaire data. So 90% of the people who were PCR positive said they could not work from home. They were still employed outside the house. So despite shelter in place orders, these individuals were not capable of doing that. They had to work outside the house. Those who could work from the home had a much lower infection rate. So this means that people who could not sustain income while this was happening are disproportionately represented. Now, even more drastic and more uh, informative was the ethnicity breakdowns, which indicated the um, Hispanic, Latino slash Latinx population was vastly disproportionately represented relative to the, the participants that were in the study. So 95% of PCR positives were the Latinx population. And uh, as you can see here in this graph, essentially, even though 981 Caucasians were tested in the same neighborhood, the four by four block area, there's a 0% infection level. Um, and I think that speaks not to any sort of genetic predisposition or anything, but it is the social determinants that probably make the largest impact on this. I want to also make the point, and this is very important, 53% of all of our positive participants reported no symptoms. So again, confirming this asymptomatic infection as being one of the underpinnings of how this pandemic spreads and why it is so different from SARS-1 in 2003. So we followed up this testing with additional uh, days of testing at transportation hubs in and around that same district, you know, focusing on where people went to work, how they got to work, and so on. I'm going to summarize those for results for you and then show you a little more data. So uh, we set up low barrier testing at our, our um, subway station or where buses come, and it was found to be uh, very high yield. It was found to be very acceptable to people who went there. We tested 2,622 people at about a rate of 100 per hour. And at that time, about a month ago when this was done or so, we are running at about 9% positive in that neighborhood. Compare that to the 0.01 prevalence in San Francisco at around the same time. Further indicating this great uh, disproportionate representation of COVID-19 in this particular district and population. Because again, this was like 96 uh, or 93% uh, Latinx. And so what did we learn from that? Uh, we learned mainly uh, that, again, the Latinx population was at higher risk. 87% were from low-income households. Um, here in San Francisco, that's defined as a, a less than median income of $50,000 a year for the entire household. And many lived in very large congregate households with you know, you know, six or more people in a house, up to 20 or 26 in a house, even at the maximum. And so uh, that seems to be also a major driver in the uneven viral distribution in our communities is again, how many people are in your house? What is your social situation? Do you have to work outside from the house? And so on. Now, some details of the Malacca results from the testing. We found that the, the distribution, and uh, we have a lot more data than this now, but here's the early data from back in, uh, in early May, that the viral distribution uh, based on CT cycle from asymptomatic to symptomatic, it's really no different. We found people with tremendous amounts of virus that were totally asymptomatic. This is especially true if you take into account seropositivity. So here we've differentiated those who are antibody positive versus negative. Anybody who has, who has sero converted, uh, for the most part, drops their viral load very, very quickly. And you can see that in the difference between the two bars in each category. Um, so if you take that into consideration and filter those out for, uh, and look at pre sero conversion, there really is no difference in, in viral load. Now, one can ask whether maybe the people who are asymptomatic are less likely to transmit, um, you know, that's, that's something that we were not able to measure directly in this study, 
but we were able to see tremendous viral loads in many asymptomatic individuals. This is a graph here that I think is very interesting that shows uh, also the self-reported days since the symptoms start uh, of the symptomatic individuals. And of course, asymptomatic, we don't know when their symptoms started, but again, versus cycle threshold. So you can uh, you know, see the viral distribution here one more time, although now we haven't differentiated the, uh, the antibody levels. Uh, I will uh, point out that we have asymptomatic individuals with CT cycles of you know, 12 or 13, indicating you know, 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th virus per mil, which is just astronomical viral loads and with no symptoms at all. And on follow-up, never did develop symptoms. Uh, what you can also see is that the viral load drops off precipitously after about 10 or 12 days of infection. And we believe that you know, viral loads or CT cycles of above 30 really do begin to represent uh, seroconversion and a lower probability of infection or transmission. Uh, not zero, but lower. Okay, uh, I've often been asked about the age ranges. And so now I'm pooling the data from all of our testing, not just the mission to look at viral load versus age bracket because many have uh, claimed and in some papers claimed that children have higher viral loads and might represent silent super spreaders. We do not believe this based on our own data as we could see no statistical difference in the viral load at any age bracket. So the good news is at least in our data, children are not super spreaders. They don't have some astronomically high viral load that's different than anybody else. But the bad news is those children have viral loads just like everybody else. So they're no different either. Um, they clearly do have less symptoms though. Um, and so this was uh, intriguing to us without a doubt. Now I'll say a couple words about impending changes in testing. And then I wanna get to genomic sequencing in the remaining time I have. So you've probably heard about uh, lateral flow, rapid direct antigen tests. This is one of them. I have uh, no financial connection to this company, Abbott, but we have been able to try their cards. So these are paper cards in which a swab is inserted and the card detects the presence of nucleoprotein directly. So it's detecting the virus, not antibodies. Uh, and like a pregnancy test, a little, a little uh, a band turns color if you're positive and it takes about 15 minutes. So this is exciting from a number of avenues because it provides a fast result. But how sensitive is it? That's the issue since there's no amplification. And so here I'm showing you some preliminary data where now we have tried many of these cards. And in this case, we use uh, clinical isolated virus and we're able to compare it to both virus PFU, genome copy numbers, and CT cycles, all relative to the actual picture of the cards down below and their quantitative band intensities. There is no reader or machine that goes with these cards. You're supposed to read them with your eyes. And so that's why the pictures are down below. And we see the sensitivity of the card really drop off at around uh, you know, a CT of around 30. It's really at, at the bottom, which indicates around a genome copy level of 10 to the fourth. And so it's interesting. We believe the cards will in fact detect uh, the, most, the highest viral loads and those who are most likely to be infectious. Will it catch every single person that's infectious? You know, maybe not because it's still gonna miss things at the high CT cycles. But again, those are likely to have lower probabilities of transmission based on what we know from viral recovery and culture. Uh, so a promising tool, it's $5 and probably that price will drop tremendously. We'll be seeing those hit the market any day now. And I think they will have a role because it is time to response. That is one of the most important factors of controlling this pandemic. If you get a result back to somebody five days later, six days later, I would argue that it's almost worthless. It's got to come back quick. And we used to think 24 hours was quick. Now we need to have things that are in the minutes, not hours. So what about viral genomics? I'm going to spend just the last few minutes here talking about viral genomics. This is the concept that, you know, the SARS virus makes mistakes. It introduces mutations into its own genome at a rate of about one mutation every two to three transmission events. And in that way, because these are basically random mutations, they leave a breadcrumb trail that allows you to track the virus back in time and through populations. Uh, and so the, this is an old picture, but the worldwide distribution of COVID train, uh, strains has a large family tree now that goes all the way back to Wuhan, China. The time is on the bottom here, the x-axis. 
And now SARS has diversified tremendously, allowing us even better precision in tracking the virus from place to place. So here's the data from the mission study that I showed you. At a gross level, when comparing it to the global clades of SARS, we can see from this tree that SARS was introduced multiple times into our community in the mission. It wasn't one outbreak. It came in several times from several different lineages. And on the right, we can see a very high resolution view that allows us to track individual transmission events from people that worked outside this census tract, um, uh, like for this individual here who's antibody positive and PCR positive, infected a house that had three individuals in it. They all shared the same genotype indicating intra-household transmission and then transmission to additional households of people outside the track who then brought it back in inside the track. So we can see the virus coming in and out of the neighborhood. And we can also see that household transmission is a major driver here. So this is a highly precision tool. Um, it can allow you to rule, uh, confirm or rule out transmission chains. It allows traceback investigations for unknown exposures. It allows you to identify new lineages and understand regional circulation, uh, as well as estimating unseen transmission that you have not in fact measured yourself. Um, so we have then booted up a large scale project with the state of California called COVID Tracker that basically on a weekly cadence generates full genome COVID data from the state of California. It is analyzed with respect to its place in the family tree and then is transmitted back to our Department of Public Health public officials in a way that allows them to interpret and act on the information. That is create actionable intervention based on the genomic data. And that cycle repeats itself every week. So now we're doing this across the state of California. Here's some examples of various different things that we've done. I don't have a lot of time to tell you about all these different cases, but I'll just highlight one and then uh, wrap up. So this is a typical example. There's a fish packing plant in California. Several individuals were COVID positive. Did they get it from each other at the plant or did they coincidentally acquire the virus in the community and bring it in? And this has real meaning for the Department of Public Health. As, you, as a public official, do you shut down this plant because it doesn't have the correct safety precautions to prevent people from becoming infected? Or is the plant not to blame? Did the people get it outside? Now you can already see the answer on the right-hand graph there. Those green uh, dots in the lower right-hand corner indicate that they're all related. And those uh, individuals were all at the plant. So in this case, transmission did occur at the workplace because they're all genomically linked. Um, and what that means is it's a single cluster and that factory needs to increase infection control, shut down for the time being, figure out what to do to help their employees be safe and then move on. And in this way, we want to provide this precision tool to public health on an ongoing basis. And uh, essentially we'd like to engineer ourselves out of the loop ultimately by training both public health officials and their labs to do genomic sequencing, providing turnkey software solutions that allow them to interpret the data and draw meaningful conclusions that allow ultimately to stop transmission chains. I'm gonna wrap up here. What we discovered, and I could talk more about at length, is that the time to response is the most important thing in this pandemic. We need faster, better, cheaper. We need minutes. If you wait hours or days to put someone in isolation or get them away from their family, uh, that is more transmission events. And of course, in the most vulnerable populations, that response has to include things like care packages to the family, um, housing assistance, food assistance, income assistance if we wanna have a hope of stopping the pandemic. Otherwise, a sick individual is going to have a need to put food on the table and go out and work anyway. Free testing is important and it has to be focused on the right populations. The virus is not evenly among our communities. We have to know where it is and who is affecting the most by their social determinants. Um, these are other uh, uh, various conclusions I'll make about our, our, our national response here, which has been, been a bit of a disaster. But uh, I'll reiterate, there's no difference in viral load between asymptomatic and symptomatic. There's no difference in age groups and young children. Here in the United States, it's been a lack of leadership, a failure to plan, uh, a plan and a terrible reliance on global supply chains that has hindered our response. We have incredible intelligence and critical intelligence in the genomic epidemiology. We need to be using that more and more effectively. And of course, our grad students and postdocs are awesome. 
that goes without saying. Uh, that's the crew at the Biohub. Big thanks to all the people there. We have a tremendous number of postdocs and graduate student volunteers that made this possible. And of course, any effort that has volunteers would not be possible without an awesome t-shirt. And uh, that's what we have there. So I'm gonna stop uh, my talk there and I'll release the, the sharing. Thank you, Joe, for this inspiring story. Um, it really wouldn't have been possible, as you said, without our students, our postdocs and our technicians to stop whatever it is that they were doing and take on the COVID challenge as it came along. And there are many such stories uh, all over the world, including here in India. Another such story is that of the Mumbai Zero Survey uh, led by Ullas Koltur and Sandeep Juneja. And I'd like to hand it over now to Ullas to tell us more about that. Ullas? Yeah, thanks, uh, Rashna, for that uh, introduction. And uh, thanks to the organizers for um, actually giving us an opportunity to share our findings from the Mumbai Zero Survey. Uh, a bit of a, a small disclaimer, this is, uh, I would like to call myself as an accidental epidemiologist. Of course, uh, any more nuanced, uh, you know, questions or answers, I think uh, there are people who have done this for a life or a living uh, who can answer this. Um, so uh, the, you know, when the COVID hit, he does. Uh, of course, you know, the, one of the first responses that uh, the, the governments uh, 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 across uh, India um, and also the central government did was to uh, introduce a lockdown. And uh, there was a clear lack of understanding of uh, the disease spread and whether, uh, of course, there was a lot of you in cry about whether we are doing enough testing. So we thought that this is important to actually go back and test uh, the actual spread of the disease in the community. Um, so for that, we thought we'll do a zero survey. Of course, one of the things that we also thought about doing was to actually uh, do a, a molecular testing uh, more on the lines uh, that uh, Joe uh, just uh, described uh, in his previous talk. But one of the uh, issues that we faced from the community was that because uh, any person who tested positive would be quarantined, we, uh, we could not really design a test uh, because the community was extremely resistant to uh, you know, giving any samples because if they, were turned to, uh, turned, if they turned out to be positive, they would be quarantined and uh, they wouldn't be, uh, you know, willing to give uh, their samples. So uh, these are the uh, the people who really contributed to this uh, the, this uh, uh, the study, which has been really huge, uh, and um, and thanks to them that we have been able to manage this. Uh, of course, a huge uh, credit goes to the people who have done this uh, study on the ground. A, a lot of field managers and volunteers. We had to employ close to about 200 people uh, to do this. Um, and it was a tremendous effort, uh, which ultimately culminated in this uh, wonderful study. So this is a brief outline. Of course, I don't want to bore you with the, the de details here, but essentially I'll be dealing with the first half of the talk uh, and then I'll transit over to Sandeep and then we'll come back to look at some of the interpretations. Now, why do a serological survey? Uh, I guess Joey did uh, kind of uh, mention this. Uh, one of the key things uh, that happened in uh, COVID or in SARS-CoV-2 is that uh, because there were a lot of people who uh, would be carrying the viruses and uh, who would be infected, uh, but don't develop uh, symptoms. So uh, at least the initial response uh, in the Indian system, also because there was uh, you know, limited testing, uh, was to only you know, test people who turned out to be symptomatic and people who reported to the medical uh, or the healthcare system. So which meant that there were a la large number of people who would uh, go unreported and but still nevertheless uh, would be exposed to the virus. Uh, an important other thing is to uh, look at progress of uh, infection uh, and get an understanding of age and locality based information, which is very important. And I'll tell you why this is, uh, uh, this is relevant. Of course, one of the other things that we could do was to ask uh, if there were contributory risk factors uh, and potentially ask about uh, gender and uh, you know, age specific uh, exposure and prevalence. Uh, we also did this uh, serological study uh, across two different time points because we want to capture the trajectory of the epidemic itself. Uh, that is useful for many reasons, which I guess uh, will become evident uh, as we go along. Um, this is also important because it, uh, it, it tends to give you a less biased picture of the risk of death because uh, it kind of uh, at least allows you to capture the, uh, the person population that is exposed to the, the infection. Um, uh, also, uh, you could uncover uh, disparities in the infection rates, uh, and that is particularly relevant for cities or mega cities, uh, um, which uh, you know now almost one fifth of the population seems to be living in mega cities. Mega cities also has a, a unique problem of having 
uh, you know, uh, unequal distribution of uh, population densities. Uh, this is just uh, in a snapshot, a heat map of New York. Uh, this is the city where NCBS is, and, and actually I happen to come from uh, Bangalore. Uh, so mega cities uh, pose a particular problem, uh, challenge, because the, you have high population density, you have overcrowding events, and the cognitive frequency is also very heterogeneous. So one could argue that mega cities provide a perfect breeding ground for the virus transmission, and therefore there is a, a particular uh, relevance for studying uh, um, epidemiological spread in, in the cities. Also, there is enough literature to indicate that uh, the spread of the disease uh, is dependent on both the frequency uh, and the density. And of course, it's actually, uh, uh, you know, depending on the context, uh, it's a mixture of uh, multiple factors that uh, you know, provide uh, spread of the disease. It's interesting that uh, I came across this paper, which actually, uh, you know, compares uh, the spread of influenza in mining versus non-mining states in the US. And there seems to be a difference, uh, of course, again, dependent on the density of the population, but also in, uh, as a factor of crowding and uh, the contact uh, frequencies. So uh, given this, of course, Mumbai uh, is one of the you know, largest cities in the world, uh, has huge uh, you know, um, disparities in terms of both population density, which is spread across the, uh, uh, the city. Also, you see huge uh, you know, disparities in terms of socio socioeconomic conditions. So one of the things that we wanted to ask is, you know, if, if there are social conditions that actually uh, you know, allow the, the viral transmission to be much more rapid than the others. Also, Mumbai has the distinction of having a large population, uh, which is uh, in slums. Of course, this is based on a 2011 census data, so uh, which made us wonder uh, and made us actually go back and ask, what are the factors that actually, uh, uh, you know, influence the spread of the disease? Are there any particular pockets or causes that you know influences spread of the infection differentially? Uh, also, this is relevant because uh, you know sometimes the policies are uh, you know uh, one you know one size fits all. Uh, it's actually not the case. Uh, it's important to understand spread of the disease uh, given the local context, and this just gives you the you know today's picture of uh, uh, the uh, the current number of reported cases in India. And uh, you already see that it's uh, very heterogeneous. So it, it is important for us to understand how uh, is the spread happening in, in Indian context. So therefore, we thought uh, uh, we designed a study to look at uh, uh, the trajectory in a complex de demography and also look at possible correlates uh, of biological variables. We picked slums and non-slums. Slums are uh, essentially highly dense, uh, uh, populated areas uh, of you know usually. Uh, belonging to low uh, uh, economic strata. Non-slums are the ones which are high rises and are better pe people with uh, much higher uh, you know, income. Uh, and we also chose, this, uh, chose to do this from three different wards, wards are essentially administrative uh, localities. But in each of these uh, wards, we picked both slums and non-slums because that's also interesting that we, uh, in, in essence, we were capturing uh, the spread of the disease in, in, in adjacent neighborhoods uh, but in the same uh, area. So that might, that also gave us a good comparison of how population density and other things would affect um, um, the transmission of the disease itself. So essentially, this is what we uh, wanted to uh, capture. And um, one of the critical things is to do was to do a, a design of the study itself. So like I said, uh, uh, motivation was to ask, uh, what is the prevalence of the disease uh, at one, as one snapshot? But go back and ask, uh, again, in the same population, but not the same individual, because we want to capture the prevalence. Uh, uh, you know, a few weeks later, we typically uh, chose to do uh, six weeks later uh, to look at the trajectory of the uh, spread, and that has actually given us a lot of surprising uh, inner finding. Now, the other thing that we did is also choose uh, two different methods. One is we looked for the presence of uh, uh, nucleocapsid antibodies, uh, where we use the commercial Abbott kit. Uh, a subset of those samples, we uh, also uh, analyzed using RBD antibodies, which are uh, developed by one of our uh, you know, uh, organizations uh, in Delhi, uh, which is DBT organization called uh, THSTI. This is an in-house developed uh, uh, kit. Now, now, just the presence of uh, circulating antibodies may or may not mean um, much for uh, in terms of understanding whether there is uh, protective antibodies that are produced. So we also wanted to uh, assay for uh, or uh, you know measure for fraction of the population that would have neutralizing antibodies, uh, and there again we choose two different uh, methods, and I'll probably elaborate a little bit on that. 
Now, one of the things that we did, like I said, is to measure uh, the presence of uh, both anti-nucleocapsid antibodies and anti-RBD antibodies. Nucleocapsid is essentially uh, a protein which is uh, present within the virus uh, inside uh, uh, with the RNA or, or its genome. Uh, RBD is, a, uh, is associated with the spike protein. And uh, much of what we know about uh, how the virus enters is largely dependent on this particular protein. So we wanted to do a comparative uh, profile of the antibodies raised against this. Um, also because uh, what happens usually in, in, in a um, disease is that uh, the molecular testing will give you the fraction of the population or the people who are exposed and actively carrying the infection because you can detect the vi presence of the virus itself. Uh, but uh, to get a prevalence of the exposure uh, at a population level, uh, antibody testing becomes relevant because you will now go back and capture all of those individuals who have ser seroconverted, which means they're able to make the antibodies. But one of the key features is that antibodies also have a peculiar uh, induction profile and they also persist for different uh, you know, periods of time. Uh, so we also wanted to look at uh, you know, um, whether uh, presence of nucleocapsid antibodies or RBD would give a better measure of uh, the prevalence. Of course, there is also the concern uh, that there is a rapid decay uh, um, in quotes, rapid uh, decay of uh, antibodies uh, which are produced against SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the other reason why we also chose two different antibodies uh, tests was also uh, for the reason that sensitivity and specificity is a concern. All, all prevalence estimates are typically governed by uh, the specificity of the CAT and the sensitivity. Um, we use the Abbott kit. Abbott has been independently validated by multiple uh, agencies, including the FDA and the um, PhD uh, England, um, shown to be having good specificity and uh, sensitivity. Um, RBD ELISA has been independently validated by THSCI and again published. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to do was to make sure that the kit, at least the Abbott kit, which we have used for all the samples, did not cross react with. Um, you know, probably coronavirus that are in, in the Indian population. So we tested about 480 samples from pre-COVID era. And, uh, you know, we found only seven of them to be positive. So which means that it had a high specificity and possibly did not cross here. That's important because depending on the, um, the sensitivity of the assay, uh, you know, suppose if you measure something as being 50% from your seropositivity, if your sensitivity assay kit is low, um, you know, you, your adjusted prevalence will be usually higher because you are detecting far fewer number of uh, you know, people in the population. Um, similarly, we also wanted to look at the neutralizing antibody for the reasons that I said. It's important to also ask whether how many of these people have, uh, seroconverted people have uh, the antibodies that can uh, potentially inhibit uh, viral uh, infection um, uh, or invasion. So uh, there again, we wanted to look at apitot dependent and independent neutralizing antibodies. So we chose to measure uh, both uh, uh, the presence of anti-RBD uh, neutralizing an antibodies and non-RBD neut neutralizing antibodies. Uh, mind you, RBD is just one small domain within uh, uh, the protein. So uh, this would also allow us to compare uh, whether uh, RBD, uh, presence of RBD antibodies and non-RBD antibodies in a population. We also want to go back and match whether uh, it has any correlates with the uh, viral titers. Uh, uh, that would become interesting to, uh, you know, probably, you know, throw out some hypothesis uh, if uh, in, you could think about the presence of non-RBD antibodies uh, which have neutralizing capacities. So with this, I'll uh, hand over to Sandeep uh, and we'll come back uh, to uh, do the interpretations later once Sandeep has described the risks. Thank you. All right, uh, so I am again a probabilist, applied probabilist, so this is uh, new to me. My, I and my co-authors from TIFR were involved in uh, building an agent-based simulation model for COVID projections. So when this opportunity came around to do a uh, zero survey, I, you know, this is a very useful input to us. So I got involved and it's been a very, um, I guess, uh, learning experience. All right, so the outline for today's, my presentation is, first I'll talk about the sampling strategy design. So how much to sample? How do we come to that uh, determination? Then random sampling design, that is where to sample. Prevalence numbers, so what do the samples say? And then correcting for antibody decay, which we saw and which is an important feature. What do the samples mean when they say? And then I'll talk a bit about IFR and uh, CFR, and that's just to highlight how bad things are. And if I have time, which I may not, I'll discuss a little bit about risk factors. 
All right, so we, as Ullas mentioned, we are doing three wards. So Daisar is up north of Mumbai. Uh, Matunga is this ward, which is kind of central part of the town. And Chembur is mostly focused on the eastern side. So they are distinct in this sense. Uh, there were two rounds. So first round was from June 30th to July 20th. And the second round from, was from August 13th to August 29th. All right, let's look at this graph now. This is uh, interesting. So this first graph is just telling us that, you know, how things looked when we were deciding which wards to choose. So around 28th of May, you know, Matunga, this is just a case infection. There's 10 day moving average of reported cases. So Matunga looked like, you know, infection was really high there. It was, uh, it was the, you know, uh, the most infected ward at that time amongst them. Uh, Chembur looked like it was a median intermediate ward. And Daisa looked like a place where infection was coming by. So it made perfect sense to go for these three wards for these considerations and for the fact that they were geographically distributed. All right, now my next picture on the right is interesting. Uh, so it's really a tale of two cities and maybe more than two cities. Uh, but this one it talks about slums and non-slums. So the dotted lines are showing the moving average of infections in slums in these three wards. So just focus on this dotted red line and then focus on the solid red line. So dotted red line is Matunga. It had a peak of infection, uh, you can see around mid of May, and then uh, it came down from there. And in the non-slums, the solid line had some kind of peak. And now after that, it's been kind of plateauing. And lately, uh, you know, since uh, mid-August thereabouts, after our survey, uh, it has actually taken off uh, again. This was when there was a Ganpati festival and a lot of intermingling in Mumbai. So, and that's been the trend across the city. So the big picture is that the slums, in the slums, infection peaked and it kind of died down. You see small amount of infection still coming from slums and a lot of it might be because migrants which have left the city early on and returning, or you know the remainder people are going out for Ganpati celebration. There is an extra intermingling, uh, but you see some amount here. Most of the infections are now coming from non-slums. What this is also suggesting is, uh, you know, if you see, if you come back to May, uh, you see that, you know, May and uh, June, when we did our first set of survey, what you see is that the number of cases are about the same in slums and non-slums. While as a set of survey shows, the prevalence in slums was about three and a half, four times more than non-slums. So that kind of gives you an indication that, you know, slums report cases much less than non-slums. Uh, you know, along with the fact that, uh, I guess, non-slums, uh, you know, uh, uh, also do some social distancing, so they have less cases. Uh, so this is interesting. And this also kind of suggests that maybe we are going to be nearing a peak soon. So this is a calculation one can do, but maybe not too far from now, we will see star cases starting peaking in non-slums, hopefully. All right, so very quickly about the sample size calculation, we estimated the overall prevalence in early June. This was using a mathematical model, so it came about 10%. We assumed, you know, we had to make some kind of prior assumption on how prevalence looked like in the world. So we assume that's proportional to the cases that we see per person. So we normalize for that. Uh, we had seen, as I mentioned to you, the cases looked about the same in slums and non-slums. So we assumed that prevalence would also be the same. So that's a, there's a smile here because this didn't turn out quite, quite as the way we expected. And then we chose our sample sizes so that the half width would be of confidence in the world would be 1.5%. We thought that's a kind of error inaccuracy we can live with. So that gave us samples of the order of 9,000. We gave Matunga 2,249 samples uh, per slum and non-slum separately. Chembur 1,622. Daisa we gave 564 because the infection seemed very less there. So as the results showed, we kind of shortchanged Daisa in the first round. Now in the second round, uh, you know, by that time we had the results of first round. And we had some budgetary constraints, constraints. So we settled for 6,000 samples and we divided them. And you can see them here that, you know, non-slum and Daisa got 579 samples, slum got 1,264. So we made up a little bit for to Daisa at this time. And then you can see the samples in the uh, other three wards, uh, slums and non-slums. Total about 6,000 samples, all right. So our aim in sampling design was to minimize the bias. You know, ideally you want to sample everybody in, in these of these wards. That we cannot do. So you want to sample as uniformly as possible given the, you know, the, the sampling budget constraints, but uh, not have too much of bias. 
So with that in mind, uh, so we sampled from larger slums in each ward. This was more from a logistics point of view, just to reduce the setup cost, uh, you know, because the setup cost to starting a, a sampling survey in a slum. We assumed about 50% consent rate. Uh, uh, and with that in mind, we chose six uh, slums in each ward. Uh, in each slum, we constructed mutually, mutually exclusive geographic polygons that covered about 400 home seats. So we assigned the team a job of you know, doing uh, 100 samples. So you take this polygon, 400 homes, go to every fourth home, and collect one sample from each home. So you start at the centroid of each polygon and contract uh, every fourth house going towards the right, just so that you know uh, there's no confusion in how things are done. In each household, a single sample was sought, and the aim was to you know go around these eight bins. So age brackets: 12 to 24, 25 to 39, 40 to 60, and 60 plus, and uh, both the genders. So you the, the instruction was to rotate between them as much as possible. And if a home is logged or does not consent, move to the next home on the right. Okay, so this is just to give an idea. So this is Matunga map. Uh, this is the area where the slums are. So this is again the, the slums. We, uh, you know, we uh, uh, made them into blocks, and then in each block, so these are the four blocks that we have. We divided each block into a, in a group of 400 houses. Roughly, all of this we knew the area. We didn't, you know. Uh, and we knew the overall population, so we assumed that uh, across slums, the area is proportional to the population. With that as the guide, we could get a rough idea of where uh, you know, about 400 homes would be. And then we identified centroids in each block, and uh, that's how the sampling instructions were given. Uh, so actually, in reality, when the sampling happened, there were practical issues. About 15 to 20% of households were logged. Consent rate actually turned out to be higher than expected, so around 70 to 80%. Which gives you faith that okay, there's you know little of bias that way at least. You know, while the medical team may not have started the centroid, the fourth house rules were, rule was by and large followed. Uh, a reasonable representation from each bracket and gender was obtained. Now consent became harder in the slums in the second round. You know, there was a festival going on. There were other kind of uh, uh, you know antigen tests going on. There was a lot of fear in the slums that uh, you know you'll be quarantined if you test positive. This was more so the second time around. And there was also some disenchantment. I think in the, for some logistical reasons, we were not able to give reports fast enough in the first round. So in particular, in our Chambur West, we missed uh, some, you know, we missed our target. In non slum we randomly selected buildings using uh, randomly selected names for vote, voter roles, uh, and we oversampled to account for anticipated low consent. Uh, it turned out the consent was actually lower than the anticipated low consent. Uh, so we sought permission from every resident association. Uh, our aim was to sample again a single person from a specified age group and gender from every fifth house. And the consent rate turned out to be extremely low. So then we had to use uh, cooperators' help and some contacts to approach buildings. But within buildings, we ensured that you know we never took two samples from the same floor. So with some separation, we did ensure so there was less dependency amongst people. Interestingly, in the second round. Uh, this consent improved dramatically because the first round got a great deal of uh, media coverage. So second round, people realized that this was going to be useful and it's uh, worthwhile to participate. Uh, so, and all the other usual things, we saw geographic separation uh, across buildings, uh, et cetera. And then uh, we were able to get about 2000 samples from the non slums from the budgeted, which were about 4,400. So we had to cut down here. Uh, fortunately, the second round, we were able to meet our targets. Okay, this is just to give you an idea that in Matunga, you know, this is what we planned. We wanted our buildings to be spread out. Uh, and this is what we ended up achieving. So not too bad. You know, we went to these areas and then sampled across buildings uh, somewhat far removed in these areas. And this is uh, uh, for Chembur and then, uh, no, that was for, sorry, Daisar, and this is Chembur. All right, now let's talk about the data. Uh, so prevalence numbers, uh, you know, so in the first round, so I just showed this to you, the slums are on the top. So we had Matunga, Chempur, and uh, Daisar. Uh, so 2144 samples were sampled here. Uh, and we saw a prevalence of 57.8%. So that's a positive three day. That's the number of percentage of people who turned out to be positive with a small error of plus minus 2.1%. In Chembur West, this was 56.7%. Daisar, 51%. So fairly high prevalence in the slums. 
far higher than that we had anticipated. So enormously surprising at that time. And even more interesting, well, not more interesting, but also interesting is the fact that the second round, when we went there about 40 days later thereabouts, uh, so the July 10th is the mean date here, and in August 20th is the mean date here in the second round, we see a lower prevalence, 44.6%, 48.9%, 43.9%. What's interesting is as follows, Matunga, we know, had peaked earlier in its infections. So you see lower prevalence here in Matunga. Chembur West had peaked a little bit later, and you see, okay, reduction is somewhat lower, and Dysar had peaked later, uh, last of these three, and then you see somewhat lower prevalence here. So again, suggestive that there was some kind of antibody decay. It's not that we went to a different area and we, uh, you know, we, what we did, I should mention, we went pretty much to the same area. We avoided sampling the same people as much as possible. Um, and we went to, you know, because we couldn't get, collect samples from, uh, uh, you know, we, have, we tried to avoid the same kind of houses as well. But uh, because we found insufficient samples in the few slums we went to, we went to a few more slums so that we had adequate uh, samples taken. So with that, we don't really expect this difference to happen because we are sampling a, comp a different population. It's very suggestive that this is more because the antibodies decay. Now, the lower table is for non-slums. And here you see 17.4% you know, uh, positivity rate in Matunga, 15.6% in Chembur West, and 11.4% uh, in uh, Dysar. So non-slums, uh, you know, they are more spaced out. There's more opportunity to, for people to uh, socially distance. And that is showing itself in the numbers. Slums are highly congested. People can't avoid crowding. There are many points, you know, like uh, for common toilets, common water spaces, uh, you know, shops are limited. So for all those reasons, you expect high prevalence there. And what's interesting is that you do see lower prevalence in non, you know, much lower prevalence in non-slums. Now, again, when you move to round two, you now what we have seen between July and August, uh, you know, if you observe the data, and if you also remember my charts, that a lot of infection was actually coming from non-slums. So there was much increase anticipated in the, in the positivity rate, but what we see is a very marginal decrease. So 17.4% becomes 19.6%, 15.6% becomes 18.1%, 11.4% becomes 12.5%. So marginal increase, but to, uh, to my mind, that's uh, suggestive of the fact that there's uh, you know, two things going on. Infection is increasing, but antibody levels are decaying. All right, uh, so prevalence was slightly higher for females. So this you can see here that in round one, 59.3% females were found to be positive and 53.2% males were found to be positive. This changed to 46.4% in uh, round two and 44.4% in uh, uh, amongst males in round two. So you can see that, you know, at least in the round two, it's not statistically significant. Combined, it would be statistically significant. Um, but it's not, it doesn't stand out that you cannot explain away by physical reason that maybe, you know, women in slums have to uh, be more mobile and uh, hence are likely to be more uh, infected. Now, if you look at non-slums, again, you know, the numbers are fairly close. So certainly not statistically significant. So females in round one, 16.8%, males 14.9%. In round two, females were 17.6% and males were 16.7%. So, you know, everywhere females are slightly higher. So that's interesting, but uh, not very significantly except in the slums in round one. Now this is prevalence by age. So recall we had bucketed our samples in these four buckets by age. So what you see interestingly, and this let me point out that 41 to 60 age group and above 60 age group has 59.6% positivity in round one, 62.6% positivity uh, above 60 age group again in round one. So this is somewhat higher than uh, the younger people in the slums uh, in the round one. And that pattern continues also in round two. So 50.3% for 41 to 60 year old, above 60, 48.2%. So that's higher than 12 uh, to 40 year, year age group. Maybe there is something there. Maybe, you know, because in uh, slums, people not, are not choosing so much to consent and all. That's not, that's less of an issue. Uh, so this does suggest that maybe infection has uh, some age bias to it. Uh, now, when you come to non-slums, you instead see that younger folks have higher uh, prevalence. So 18.8% in round one from 12 to 24 year old, 
and that becomes 18.5% uh, in round two. Samples are less, so it's difficult to conclude too much. And uh, above 60, the numbers are lower, but that's understandable that you know people, slum, non-slums have older people, much more so than slums, and they are trying to socially distance themselves. And that's working, I guess. That's the conclusion from here. All right, um, healthcare workers were also sampled. So over the two rounds, we sampled 728 workers. These workers end up mostly working in slum areas. And you, we saw in both the rounds about 27% prevalence, positive fraction. So that's uh, suggestive that you know healthcare workers tend to be careful, although they're around so much of infection, by, bear, by wearing uh, protection, their prevalence is much lower than prevalence of people who are living in the slums. So again, reinforcing the fact that uh, protection does help. All right, so decline in antibodies for uh, nucleocapsid protein and some correction. So I just talk about this for a moment. So there's a lot of other work that's also come, which also points to the fact that we are using Abbott kit and that's uh, testing for nucleocapsid the protein and uh, the antibodies uh, corresponding to that are decay quite fast. So this was pointed out by this uh, uh, study on Brazilian Amazon, but also in this study on uh, in Canadian uh, population. Okay, so decline. So you can see this curve. Now this is the titers. Uh, it's the frequency plot in the round one is on the top and round two is on the bottom. And what you see is, okay, in the round two, we know that the numbers are going to be less. So they are you know, more shifted towards the left. But what you also see that the larger numbers are missing. So 9.85, 9.6, you see such, some numbers in the first round. You don't see them in the second round suggesting that more that these kinds of numbers have kind of declined rather than the fact that you saw less of those numbers. So anyways, these are all suggestions right now. You know, one can't be completely sure. All right, I should also mention here that 1.4 level is the cutoff, you know, in uh, as per Abbott clinic uh, test. So if you're below 1.4, you're counted as uh, negative. Above 1.4, you're counted as positive. All right, so a quick calculation. So we did ask people in the second round whether they were tested in the first round. 44 people from slum, very small percent, if you're trying to avoid them, tested negative in the first round and retested, 17 turned out to be positive in the second round. So quick calculation, 0.55 was the estimated prevalence in the first round, uh, 0.45 was the negative population. Now we are saying that 32% of that is positive. That tells you that actually you should be looking at 73% plus minus a wide confidence interval. But you know, the point is it should be higher than 55% prevalence estimate and more like 70% uh, uh, thereabouts in uh, round two. Similarly, four out of 18 negatives from non slum tested positive in round two, so that suggests uh, a higher percentage, maybe higher than you know, 25, 30% perhaps, but the number exactly is 34% here. So this is just a back of envelope cal cal calculation. Now, this is a closer look at titers if you look around 1.4. As I mentioned, below 1.4, you're negative, above 1.4, you're positive. And what you see is, which is nice from a probabilist point of view, is that this is all uniformly distributed, more or less. So you can model it as a uniform distribution. That means if you were to make assumptions about how the, the antibody levels are decaying, suppose they are decaying at a linear rate or at an exponential rate, then you get an idea of how the overall probabilities are going to change. So let me just do a quick attempt at that. So I'm going to build a small model. So perfect, a person infected at time zero and time zero could be somewhere in late March has probability P of cellular reversion by round one. Round one, we call is around July 10th. Okay, so we assume it's P, and then we assume that the probability of cellular reversion decays exponentially with time at rate alpha. So you become less likely to have uh, your antibodies decay as you get closer to the first round date. Now, if you were infected, then you'll continue to be infected. Infection occurrence time distribution is proportional to observed cases distribution. So we don't, you know, we just see the cases, we just see the infection at two time uh, slots uh, on the first round one and round two. And round two has all kinds of antibodies decaying issues. So in round one, you know, how did this infection actually happen? We'll assume that we have a distribution of how the cases happened were reported up till that time. We'll just assume that infection was also distributed exactly in the same manner. It's, you know, it's the best assumption we can make under the circumstances. Now cases depend upon uh, the, the strategy of the government. You know, sometimes government ramps up case uh, testing, sometimes it slows down. So you know all of those cause, cause, you know make our assumption uh, less accurate, and then we'll assume that the zero prevalence at round one is m. Um, so these three are numbers m, alpha, and p. And now what we do is we just do some kind of uh, you know optimization problem. You sum of square of error 
So choose these three parameters so that the uh, sum of scalar errors is minimized between predicted and observed cellular diversion at two time periods. So when you do this, you get that the estimated prevalence uh, for slums in round one is around 60 to 65% compared to measured 55%. And in round two, around 70 to 77%. Estimated prevalence for non-slums in round one is around 17 to 21%. Uh, compared to 16% and around 28 to 35% measured is 17.5%. Reason I'm giving you a range is that this is not a nice convex pro programming problem where you get a nice unique solution. You get all these solutions where errors look very similar. So this is still ongoing, uh, but you know, right now the errors are so in different that it's so small that you can't really differentiate between these points. But you know, with the kind of uh, inaccuracies going around, these are reasonable ranges to live with. Okay, now we also did uh, 560 samples we took from uh, round one random samples and tested them using uh, RBD ELISA as, uh, as last mentioned. RBD, as you know, is uh, deceptor uh, uh, bound domain. I had to look it up on in Google, by the way. It's, it says uh, rather be drinking. And I, I kind of like that. And that's the first time I enjoy getting a Google answer. Um, but then again, sorry, I'm not that familiar with these things. So the separate binding domain, it's a part of the, the spike protein uh, uh, in the virus that attaches itself to infected cells. Uh, so positive rate for slums, as per this 560 sa samples came out to be 73% plus minus 4%. This is for round one. And positivity rate for non-slums non came out to be about 25% plus minus 9%. For non-slums, we just didn't have enough samples. So this suggests that first round prevalence may be higher than the 55%. So what's going on is as follows. First of all, you know, 55% that we measure in first round, you have to keep in mind that at that time also, there was some decline in antibodies that had happened. So the actual number should have been higher. And secondly, I think what we're observing is that the you know, uh, uh, antibodies to the spike uh, protein uh, tend to decay at a lower rate. So that also is kind of manifest itself. And then, yeah, you know, it's a big variation between 55% and 73%. So I think we need to understand these things better. But directionally, what it's telling you is that, you know, it's not 55%, it's somewhat higher than that. And our calculations show between 60 and 65% for the first round, above 70% for the second round. All right, so let's uh, talk about IFR and CFR rates. Uh, so case fatality rate on July 15th, uh, 17th was 6.25%. So that's, uh, you know, it's just uh, the numerator is the fatalities that you've seen. And the denominator is that the observed cases in the city or in these three wards, and that was 6.25%. And that came down to about 4.2% now. It's reflective of the fact that uh, there's more testing and more cases. And also because over time, our medical facilities have improved. So actually the fatalities are lowering. Infection fatality rate uh, is much lower. So 0.08% for slums. 0.282%, these are all estimated. So these are you know, directionally correct, but there's there errors around them. And overall 0.127%, but this may be higher because there are significant unreported fatalities. It's estimated that about 50% of fatalities, uh, in the, the, the fatalities that we saw by end of July, by end of June, uh, they should have been about 50% higher than that. So one can do some adjustments for that. Now, if you also look at as, uh, age, you know, age-based analysis, you know, using Wuhan disease progression data, and then arrive at numbers IFR for slum and non-slum. And here you keep in mind that slums are younger. So in our survey, we also asked people what their, you know, what was the family size, what was the distribution of family members in their household. So that gave us a lot of information about how the age is distributed in the slums vis-a-vis non-slums. So then, you know, by this separate calculation, one sees the slum IFR looks like 0.126%, and non slum IFR looks like 0.25%. Here again, we are assuming, and this matches the data from Mumbai, that 40% of people who are infected are symptomatic. If we were to follow Joe's data of 53% people being, uh, you know, I guess 47% being symptomatic, then these numbers would increase a little bit more and become closer to these numbers if you adjust for the fact that there were unreported fatalities. So ballpark, ballpark one gets an idea of what these numbers look like. Uh, all right. So roughly seven to eight percent infected people end up getting tested in non-slums. So if you get infected, there's a seven eight percent chance that you get uh, tested in slums. One to two percent. So much lower people, uh, people getting tested in slums. So these are just estimates. 
uh, and this is the age distribution. So you actually see here that, all right, these reddish, brownish bars are, uh, are Islam populations, so it's younger than the non-Islam population. So this is from the data that we got. Uh, let me now close up because I think I've taken up more than my time. Uh, I'll just ask maybe Ullas to come back and then we both can talk about some of the interpretations. So I'll stop by sharing my screen. Yeah, thanks Sandeep. Um, since it looks like we are uh, slightly overshooting uh, in terms of time, uh, I don't think uh, I would want to uh, elaborate more. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, our study and of course the ones uh, that uh, Joey has uh, presented uh, you know, raises important things about uh, the caseloads, uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic. Looks like uh, we have a large number of asymptomatic, asymptomatic cases um, in, in Mumbai, uh, especially in, in, the, in the slums. Uh, also, uh, this draws uh, one more important uh, uh, you know, thing into consideration, which is uh, reporting rates uh, to the medical system or the health system, uh, which we found uh, is typically lower in in the uh, in the socially or economically backward uh, communities than in the uh, the, the well-to-do communities. Uh, does it inform our herd immunity? This is something that probably many people would want to know. I, again, because of a lack of time, I will not uh, go into this. If somebody asks a question, we will go into this. Uh, we did find some gender specific variations could be largely because of um, sociological behavior of women going out more. Um, this raises interesting questions about differential response between the anti NC and the anti RBD antibodies. Uh, now, I don't know, maybe I'll ask a question to Joey about uh, whether symptomatic versus asymptomatic would, uh, would there be any uh, you know, difference and would uh, gender and age uh, make a, uh, you know, any, uh, would have any impinging effect, you know, role on whether uh, you will see higher or lower uh, uh, antibodies uh, raised against one of the others. But uh, more importantly, we are going to uh, test for uh, the uh, neutralizing antibodies. So with that, I'll uh, end because I guess we'll have to leave time for questions. Thank you. Uh, and I will hand it over to Prashna. Thank you, uh, Ulas and Sandeep for this uh, really informative presentation on a study that uh, I hope a lot of people have paid attention to and it will help uh, us deal with this ongoing pandemic. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, uh, our other panelists, uh, Shashi Dara and Jacob John to please join us. Uh, do turn on your videos and unmute yourselves. I'd like to open up the panel discussion uh, with the question on immunity. Uh, the Spiro surveys have shown uh, that a large number of people, uh, a significant chunk of the population is zero positive. Does this really mean that they are immune? And if so, how long does this immunity last? Uh, Shashi, would you take that first? And then I'll ask uh, Jacob to weigh in on that. So uh, obviously the immunity question maybe can go to Jacob, uh, but what I can add is in the zero survey, both what Ullas was talking about and the, the Pune zero survey, uh, we have done both uh, in vitro neutralization assay as well as live virus neutralization assay. There is a very high concordance of the zero prevalence to the, the protection immunity related assays, right? So assuming that you know, a large percentage of the people are immune, suggest that that means, you know, the seroprevalence and immunity sort of correlate very well. There is a high degree of concordance. But at the community level, at the population level, I'm not sure what it means because there is still very high, uh, you know, test positivity. For example, if you Pune, if you like take it, more than 50% of the people on an average, at least in the regions where we did the survey, are seropositive. But still, we have more than 15% test positivity. In fact, last month, it was more than 25%, right? Even after showing 50% seropositivity in those regions. Of course, the regions where there is, uh, um, uh, you know, the high levels of seropositivity, uh, there was somewhat lower test positivity, but doesn't mean much. So that also tells us what is actually how we are testing. Are we testing only people who are showing some symptoms? So obviously, zero positivity, oh, sorry, test positivity will be very high. And so it, more than that, there is a continuous spread of the infection, right? So that means even if 50% people are 
protected against infection, uh, there is still a large number of people are spreading the infection. So there are some discussion can happen on that line, uh, particularly with the experts around here. So the, the other aspect of the protection immunity you are talking about from seroprevalence, if you look at the Mumbai data, there is higher uh, you know, incidence of seropositivity if you compare people who were earlier negative and then became positive this round two. Although it looks like some aspect of titer is going down. Whether the titer is the right indication of the immunity is another question because not necessarily that you know NC you know antibodies against the nuclear capsid protein or the RBD domain uh, per se may or may not say anything about the immunity uh, simply because uh, that I mean sorry the titer may not say anything about the immunity. So again, the bigger question is maybe we have to empirically test immunity the way I think both Mumbai and Pune people are doing. And that will help us understanding the real immunity. Right. Okay. Thank you. Done. Thanks, Shashi. Uh, Jacob, would you like to weigh in on this? Yeah, maybe briefly. Um, so what the zero survey in Mumbai uh, seems to clearly show us is that a, a large section of the dense urban population, especially in the slums, have not only been exposed, they have been infected and have mounted some kind of an immune response. Uh, so your question really has two parts. One is, does this immune response correlate with protection? And whether this immunity that we see now, how long does it last? Will it protect? For how long will it protect? Uh, I'd like to break that up. And essentially, first, I'd like to think about the large proportion of the population being infected. That's certain. And that fact that they have had an immune response. Question is, we've measured some specific type of antibody response, whether that truly reflects protection is not known and which is why ULAS and others have looked at other assays, including the neutralization assays. And once we know about that, we'd probably be in a better space to answer this question about whether this immunity correlates with protection. The second part is about whether these antibodies that we are seeing Will they decay over time? There is evidence that antibodies rise very rapidly. They also fall quite quickly, but they come down to a level at which they persist for a while. And a second part of what happens with immunity is also that you have a cellular response and then some kind of memory being formed. And hopefully when exposed again to this virus, you would mount a rapid response, which should protect in some way. Now, that's the traditional way of looking at it. The question now is, um, what about this test? What is it showing about the 56 and the 44 person in the slum, the decline? Um, we'll worry about that. Maybe if there's somebody else wants to talk, uh, talk about it, we can take that as well. But I think it has got both to do with a decline in antibodies that we might expect, but also you know, confidence intervals in these settings are a little difficult to interpret. These are cluster surveys. They have had challenges in getting random subsets of population. So between 55 and 48, I wouldn't read too much between the lines, only to say that the antibody levels are extremely high. And this would suggest in normal course of events that people would be immune. Um, how would you answer this, this question also about how long does it last? And people have been doing these interesting longitudinal studies. They've also been looking at how the T cell responses and the memory cells being created. That is the next phase of questions that need to be answered to answer whether antibodies or exposure and infection, will that result in a long-term protection? I'll stop here and let the others also chip into this. So, uh, you know, there are two aspects, um, you know, when you look at this kind of a pandemic. One is, of course, post-infection, the immunity that your question you're asking. The sec first question is, of course, many people are asking about, are we more resistant, right? Are, you know, is mortality low in India? Is IFR lower in India? And, and why there are so many asymptomatic cases? People clearly say that they know at one day, uh, you know, that Indians are, you know, are less prone for infections or their in IFR is lower. So the, what I'm saying is the age stratified IFR and, you know, I think, uh, you know, older people having higher IFR and is maybe as higher as anywhere in the world or even maybe higher. Uh, so I guess 
if you look at the at the ethnic level or community level at the national level if indians are not showing any specific uh, you know features that they are less infective uh, less infected or they have a lower level of mortality if, if those myths are busted then i guess when you talk about immunity we can actually start looking at the global picture of what the results are coming and see we can you know uh, ex- ex- extrapolate that to indian population because right. every time so keep seeing that in india we have to reinvent everything in simply because our population may be different but in this kind of infection maybe there's no much difference right so so shashi didn't just talk about immunity he also talked about the infection fatality rate and whether it is really true that that is different in india uh, versus the rest of the world and that's probably a topic for another discussion uh, but i I'd, i'd like to now come back to the joe's talk about testing now uh, we heard very clearly and emphatically that the viral load is the same between symptomatic and asymptomatic cases and and therefore the transmission possibility from whether from somebody who's symptomatic or asymptomatic would pretty much be identical whereas testing always initially relies on somebody to come forward and that somebody always has symptoms and then you contact trace and find who that person is related to and who else they may have been infected so how do you keep testing ahead of transmission is there a strategy that we can we can we change our testing strategy can we change contact tracing uh, strategy so that testing stays ahead of transmission and i'd like to uh, joe to weigh in on that first and then jacob uh, to talk about the possibility of backward tracing joe would you go first please sure absolutely uh, my thoughts on this uh, are pretty simple Uh, I do think that we should be modifying the way we test. So a couple points that I made during my talk, the, the populations that have the virus that are infected are different. They're not evenly distributed. So testing and resources need to be focused where the virus resides the most. If you have, you know, wealthy populations with very low incidence, like what is the point of testing those people? You need to take your, your, your resources and put them to where the battle is actually occurring. Uh, that's number one. Number two, we need to be testing asymptomatic people as well as symptomatic. And uh, you know, one of the models that we use here at UCSF is the so-called quality lot assurance model, where you take a certain fraction of the population that rotates as a per unit time. This is what they do in factories to make sure that the product's going out the door of a quality. It's the same sort of model. but it doesn't depend on knowing if you're symptomatic or asymptomatic and in this way you can catch and detect things and then third you need very fast testing you can't wait days you have to wait 15 minutes and then you can put those people in isolation and you need this is very important you need local legislation to uh, support that so here in San Francisco uh, this study motivated the passing of right to recover meaning you can't lose your job if you have to isolate in quarantine you can't be fired that's super important and that you have to re- provide replacement income or food for families that do have infections otherwise you are indirectly promoting the propagation of infection by forcing people to work outside i'll stop there yeah yeah that that's a very pertinent point uh, joe i think because uh, social scientists need to be involved in this is what basically you're, you're telling us not just researchers and and medical uh, personnel and and we need more social science input so uh, thanks joe for that answer and uh, jacob over to you rashan i think joe's point is really important that uh, testing is really contextual and it needs to be implemented in the right settings so even if you think about india and the course of the pandemic testing had different roles at different points in time when we were very early into the pandemic before it would community transmission had established itself the way you would have gone about trying to screen everybody test everybody that would have been really good to do and trust test trace isolate you know using a shotgun appro- approach so to speak unfortunately supply chains were an issue and we weren't as smart as joe's group to be able to find the right supply chains the lockdown didn't help us um because we just could not get any of the supplies into the country and you know manufacturing this takes time um and then when we have the test the test results come in 2 to 3 days later and then what's the point in testing so really uh it has to be contextual and what i think this point of care diagnostic being able to turn things around rapidly and finding the right place to use testing is cr- really critical um 
So what I was trying to get at is that the value of testing depends on how you could influence either transmission or the course of illness in a person. From a public health perspective, testing, if it does not change those two parameters, it's really not worth the effort. So I like this new Binax and also the antigen assays that have come in because clearly they seem to be targeting the group that is highly likely to transmit. So here comes the question about who should you target for uh, testing at this point? Should we be continuing to do the number of tests we do? Uh, as you know, that we do about 90, we have done about 91 million tests in our country. Now that translates to 91 billion rupees, uh, which when compared to the health budget of this country, it's already about 20%, 16 to 20% of the annual health budget just on testing. And this does not then translate into going out tracing them, isolating them, or providing food and shelter, as you were talking about. So clearly, uh, an approach across the country at this scale is really not practicable. And I think economy is economics of this whole thing needs to be pragmatically thought out. Uh, but I think both the testing and being able to use that knowledge, because we also know from the epidemiology now, and Adam's group in LSHTM has brought this out very nicely about how this is not really a homogeneous kind of a spread. There are clusters of people who are high risk of transmitting. They are not individuals necessarily. It's the context in which they are. Dense populations, poorer people who need to get out and go out for work, frontline workers, people who are constantly interacting with others. These are people with high probability of transmission. The Probability of transmission really depends on both the viral load the, and probability of transmitting given a contact and the number of contacts that people have over time. So each of these are critical. So we know now from what Joe presented a little earlier that viral loads seem to be uniform across a period of time. We also know that once you mount antibody responses, your viral loads are lower and they consistently seem to be that way. But so this brings us to the question about who should we test? And what we have learned from this clustering or the super spreading component is that some individuals, about 10% of the individuals seem to be responsible for 80% of the spread. So if you start identifying an individual who's infected and then try to find his contacts, this is a lost cause. And it's worse off when you can't get those reports in 15 minutes like you're talking about. Saying it should be targeted, you need to identify the people who are maximally likely to infect and only test those individuals. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, we need a rapid test and we need targeted testing, if that sums about it. Uh, we, we really can't uh, rely on the long turnaround times that the RT-PCR testing is doing. We need something sensitive and very rapid. If I have a minute, and I think this is a question on everyone's minds right now, I want to ask one last question. That is getting life back to normal. We need to open up public transport. We need to open schools. Parents are scared to send their kids to school. People are still scared about uh, taking public transport unless they really have to. So how do you get back? I know Sandeep has done some work on opening up Mumbai suburban transport. And uh, we'd also like uh, the panel's thoughts on whether it's safe to open schools. Sandeep, would you go first? Uh, sure. Uh so, you know, one thing about the numbers, I just um, add to that, that, you know, when you say 55% and then you say 45%, what's nice about those numbers is that they're actually saying that the infection was large to begin with and it's increasing. Now, if infection increases enough, then if you start your trains, the amount of, uh, you know, I guess a positive, because every time you're going to start transport in a, in a, you know, in a drastic way, you are going to see a second wave. So that size will be much, much more manageable. What's kind of holding Mumbai back right now is that, you know, although they have the beds and the ICUs, they don't have enough medical personnel right now. So that's a big issue. That's why, you know, they're going very cautiously, opening very slowly, because they have to worry about the fact that as soon as you open things up, there will be new cases and can they handle them? Uh, so that's the context of things. I would, I think by and large, uh, the, the government is proceeding well. It has to go cautiously. You open up uh, somewhat, see what your medical capacity is. As long as it can handle it, then you open up more. So that's how I would suggest things should proceed. For schools, you know, schools is much, much more risky because even if infection amongst the population is high, there will still be people who will be getting infected. So if you're, you know, if a child gets infected and comes home, then everybody in, at home is at risk. So that's, uh, that's a much riskier proposition because you're not, uh, you know, at home, you're not 
socially distant, you're not wearing masks and all, in trains you are. So it's a different level of problem. Um, I, I mean, I would again go slow on it and wait and watch, you know, maybe go on, uh, as per our model, we said, if you were to open schools in January, by that time, enough infection has happened that you can, you know, the, the amount of uh, risk that you have will be manageable. I'll stop at that. All right, so uh, we're out of time on the panel discussion. I'd like to thank all the panelists and the speakers. And then we'll now move to the question and answer session where uh, Sharda and Janine will take over. Thanks so much, Rashna. Um, we're gonna actually, uh, we, we have quite a few um, audience questions. Hopefully we can get to a good number of them. Um, but I'm gonna start with a question that came in for Joe. Um, Somebody wants to know, uh, the, the positive cases seem to be predominantly male in the area study. Um, do you have any explanation for this? And is there any sexual dimorphism in the viral load of the asymptomatic or symptomatic individuals? So first of all, when we look across all our testing across uh, the counties in California, there is no difference in viral load between male or female. And um, the rates are pretty similar across male and female as well. Now, in that population in the Minson district, which is disproportionately affected, uh, the males are overrepresented by a large degree, and that is held true. And uh, there are simple, very straightforward reasons for this. In, in that particular region, in that particular culture, the males are generally the ones that go on day labor contracts. They're construction workers and so on. And so a, you know, a group of um, multiple males will be picked up and go to a construction site, and 10 guys will s share the same cell phone. And, Things like this. So uh, it's it's uh, look, retrospectively, it's sort of obvious because those are the individuals that are spending the most time outside of the house at the job site. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Janine. Uh, our next question is for uh, Ulas. So Ulas, you showed the presence of neutralizing antibodies in your study. So in this context, could you please speak to the cases of um, reinfection that we started to see? Yeah, so actually, uh, we've not done, uh, we've, we didn't present the data for the neutralizing antibodies. In fact, we are doing those. Um, and uh, the preliminary results do indicate that a significant fraction of the, you know, sort of positive, uh, you know, samples do have neutralizing antibodies. Now, uh, as far as I uh, no, I mean, the, the reinfection cases are far fewer. Um, I think there have been only a couple of cases in India. Um, most of those have been shown to uh, also have, uh, you know, variations in terms of the, the RNA uh, sequence itself. Uh, it's a reinfection. So um, in my mind, I think if there is enough B cell uh, and T cell memory that's built in, like the, what Jacob, Jacob was saying, um, and uh, given that there is enough uh, evidence to say that there is a large population of uh, people who have uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies, uh, if the immunity persists, I think the inf infection rates would be lower. But of course, we don't know how long this lasts. So that's uh, still a waiting game. And unless uh, it really unfolds, I don't think we'll be able to uh, you know, say anything concrete. Thanks, Ulas. Um, the next question is um, for Joe. Uh, what is the false positive rate of the RT-PCR or direct antigen tests? And how do you actually distinguish between a false positive and an asymptomatic person? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, our best estimates for the false positive rate of, of the RT-PCR assay that we use in our laboratory uh, really comes from our, our testing in communities. So uh, we did test uh, a town called Bolinas, which is in nor just north of San Francisco. It's a, a, a more well-to-do town. And we tested literally every single individual in the town, 1,400 individuals, and there were absolutely no positives. So zero out of 1,400. 1, uh, therefore, by definition, our false positive rate is less than 1,400. Now, you can also uh, have false positives due to contamination or other issues, and I'm treating that separately here. Um, so uh, we don't think that false positives other than um, uh, it, you know, occasional human errors on labeling or something like that uh, really play a major part in the results that we've seen here. Now, the false positives on Binax on Oncart, uh, like direct antigen lateral flow assays, that's an important point. Because remember, the assay that uh, is in that card relies on the human eye to read. 
It's not a machine or, or anything like that. And so there is, when the band is very, very faint, you know, some subjectivity, some people see one thing, some people see another. Uh, and so I do worry about false positives in that area. We did work on ways of training our observers to read the cards very carefully by testing them on a large panel of previously tested known positive and negative controls. And that kind of training did help the observer actually learn better how to read the cards and improve the rates dramatically actually to where the point where you almost eliminated false positives. Um, so I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Joe. And slightly switching gears, here's a question on phylogeny. So starting with Joe, how phylogenetically distinct were the strains across San Francisco? So San Francisco, when we look at the diverse, the strains that are in the city or in our county surrounding our city, they're incredibly diverse. You know, the San Francisco is a cosmopolitan melting pot and you can see that. Unlike, for example, the outbreak in New York, which was really dominated by only a few genotypes, we see genotypes that really represent the world distribution uh, throughout San Francisco, which, and we can see that there have been many, many very small introductions again and again and again, probably by travel into San Francisco. However, these transmission chains within the city appear to be very short with the exception of some of these vulnerable communities that I've discussed. And so they're, they're actually cut short but they keep coming in. And so that's one area where genomic epidemiology can really play a role to understand whether you're looking at ongoing forward transmission of the same viruses in your community, or whether you're looking at importation of new strains into the community from outside. Thank you. And in fact, I'd like to add to this and extend this to um, Ulas and Sandeep, or for that matter, the other panelists. What do we know about the phylogeny of the virus infection in India? Jacob, would you want to answer that? Because I think you probably kept a track, or maybe Shashi, because efforts uh, at genomic sequencing. I mean, uh, I, mean no, I have access to only some data. The, there is a clear indication that there are certain strains, particularly the, the A2 strain, A614G, uh, 614G, uh, is dominant, uh, you know, after about three months of infection. I think the April, May, June or so, uh, we had multiple strains. Looks like there is some selection for one of the strains. Uh, this is the data that was analyzed, uh, you know, some time ago when there were about a few hundred uh, viral genomes were sequenced and and they were on the on the influenza virus genome database, right? And monthly distribution, if you look at, there is a one particular strain uh, which is, I think, uh, 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 which is dominant anyway all over the world right now. Looks like there has been a selection for one. I think the super spreader theory, which uh, Jacob talked about, it clearly indicates that there could be easily a selection can happen to one or two strains, and most other strains in the beginning, whatever they you know earlier, would sort of get eliminated is because some people spread more than the others, and the, what gets spread and what finally gets selected would be just a few strains. And of course, it's continuously mutating, uh, but there would be still a clear, you know indication that some selection is happening. I don't know whether that correlates to a lower uh, disease prevalence, lower mortality at later stages compared to earlier time of infection, like, you know, if, you know, in March, April, there's a very high levels of mortality all over the world, wherever there was infection and compared to later stages. I don't know about that part. Someone has to do some correlation. So in fact, how does it correlate with virulence versus um, uh, in the disease outcome is pathogenicity is an interesting question to ask. Thank you both. Um, I have an audience question for Sandeep. Um, did you uh, attempt to stratify your results by household income and not just by slum, non-slum? No, you know, we had to keep our questionnaire very simple. So we didn't ask for those questions at all. So no, we don't have that information. And, and another um, question is, um, um, the audience member noticed uh, two clear distinct peaks in the data that you showed in non-slums compared to slums, um, and wants to know, does this indicate that slums achieved herd immunity sooner than non-slums? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's, these are two separate cities. Uh, so right now, you're seeing very little infections coming from slums, uh, very few fatalities coming from slums. So, you know, that's a place where we saw a lot of, that, you know, a lot of cases coming in May and uh, April, May and June, thereabouts. 
So they have kind of quietened down and we are seeing most of our activity now in non-slums. Well, I think it's the situation in multiple places, even in other cities too. Uh, it's simply because it's again socio-economic factors. The people in the slum couldn't afford us, you know, to be in the, the lockdown condition both physically because of the smaller houses, at the same time also economically they had to be outside, somehow managed to get some food. Whereas the people who could afford are the ones who actually isolated themselves much better. But now when we started relaxing the lockdown, uh, the, the people are the ones who actually earlier, earlier protected themselves are the ones getting infected now. Thank you, Sandeep and Sashi. Uh, and while we are on the topic of socioeconomic background, here is a question for Joe. Joe, you showed us data from the Latinx population. So the audience wants to know if whether you've extended this to other social groups as well, especially to more privileged backgrounds. And if so, in your opinion, to what extent do, do socioeconomic factors contribute to the disease? Yes, I, I had hoped to make that point clear during my talk. So maybe I'll re-clarify because this was the point of the talk. The census tract survey in the Mission District, it's a unique geography. Uh, it's not like a slum or non-slum. In the same four block area, you have a lot of uh, people working for Google and Twitter and Facebook and Apple, and they're extremely well off, living right next door to people with very low social household income. And so, you know, you have the exact same geographic area, but very mixed socioeconomic status and ethnicities. And in that one area, despite being just neighbors next to each other, you have a very disproportionate representation of the virus. Those with low social, those with low household income and high congregate living, meaning many people living in the house, were many, many times the, the full risk, eight times higher, 10 times higher, than their neighbors who had a high had high income and could live a privileged life and you know work from zoom in their office you know programming very different than someone who had to go to the job site even though they're neighbors and so yes it is a major factor and that is where we're advocating that the resources be put take the fight to where the battle is and it is largely governed by social determinants I think um, at this point, um, we are going to uh, wrap it up. Um, I think we've um, <laughs> hit our time limit, but um, I just want to, you know, on behalf of TNQ and Janelia and everyone, once again, um, thank our speakers, Joe, Ulas, Sandeep for the really interesting talks today. I also want to thank um, Rashna, Jacob and Sashi for a really stimulating discussion. Um, I think we all learned a whole lot. Um, I want to also encourage everyone to join us for the third, for the third seminar next Friday at the same time um, on October 23rd, where our speakers will be Florian Kramer, um, who will talk to us about vaccine and therapeutic landscape for COVID-19, and also Benjamin Tenover, who will talk to us about leveraging innate immunity as a first line defense against SARS-CoV-2. So thank you all and uh, please join us again next Friday.